Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for this edition of Ask Me Anything, um, sponsored by the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My name is Brian Sturm. I'm the Associate Dean. I'm also your MC for this event. And um, we've got a wonderful slate of uh, faculty to talk with you and um, to, to uh, answer your questions if you have them. If you do have questions during the uh, presentation, please enter them in the, uh, in the little box, uh, the description box on YouTube. Um, and that will feed into us and I will do everything I can to get those questions answered. We do have some, uh, some questions that have been submitted already. So if you don't have questions, particularly for, for someone, you can certainly sit and, uh, and just enjoy the conversation. So our first faculty member um, is uh, going to be coming up. Her name is Francesca Tripodi. And I will wait for just a moment while we do that transition. Um, welcome, Francesca. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and um, I have all sorts of questions um, that have been posed for you and uh, some that I'm curious about myself. So uh, we'll try and get through all of those in our somewhat limited 15 minutes. Um, but the first one I would like to start with is um, if you could tell us what you're working on uh, academically or what your sort of future research projects are, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So I just, I'm excited. I just released a book on Tuesday. And one of the things I talk about in my book is thinking about how worldviews impact our search queries and how the way we think about concepts really influence those very first um, words we enter into a search bar. And so right now I've just started a new research project um, thinking about how this has an implicit, uh, um, uh, explicit impact on the kinds of returns that are fed back to you. So a lot of people focus in for, um, on information on this role of personalization. And while we do know that personalization does impact some things, specific like geolocation, if I'm searching for pizza and somebody in New York is searching for pizza, obviously we're going to get very different returns. Um, but I'm really interested in how this impacts like news and information, not just necessarily um, where to get good takeout when you're traveling. Mm -hmm. So um, to follow up a little on that, the sense of, of personalization of search results, um, how do you feel that that is impacting um, the, the, the sociological world in which we live? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot about the way what we refer to as sociologists as like these deep stories. So what are the truths that we've been told since growing up that we just don't really necessarily acknowledge to be um, uh, constructive, right? Things that seem like very natural or inevitable. And so in sociology, this like social construction of reality and interactionist theory thinks a lot about how who we interact with shapes that shared sense of reality. But what I like to think about is how um, search engines and other kinds of participatory practices are also part of that interaction. And so if I, for example, um, my favorite example is thinking about like the color of the sky. So if I have been raised to think like, oh, the sky is blue and I search um, the sky is blue, I get information returned to me that confirms that reality. But if I think that the, if I'm like adamant that the sky is not blue, and I search the sky is not blue, the first return comes back. It's like um, a story from NASA that talks about how uh, the um, chemical compounds in the atmosphere really influence the kinds of color that comes through and filters in the sky. If you search the sky is red, you're going to get information about uh, red sky delights, red sky sailors delight, red sky in the morning, right? right. Sailors take warning. If right. you search like the sky is green, you get information about how skies turn green before a tornado. And so in, in many ways, right, we, we think about how all these other factors influence those kinds of first, first kinds of impact, um, those inputs. 
But what I really want to think sociologically is like how our deep stories impact those those queries and then and then very much shape the kinds of information that's returned to us so that we walk away with these ideas and understandings of truth um, that are heavily predicated on like what we're going into already. Right, right. So um, I, mean, I think I've heard the term, the, the sort of information bubble that we surround ourselves with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The that, filter bubble or the, yeah. the echo chambers. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of um, really interesting theory on like filter bubbles and echo chambers. These, these largely tend to look at the way that tech companies keep us um, in sources of information that reconfirm our ideas. And while definitely technology does play a role in the kind of information that's returned to us and the kind, you know, how it's, how that information is ordered. I like to also think about the role society plays in um, constructing that algorithmic process, right? Because the algorithm isn't just the export, the, the outputs, it's also the inputs combined with outputs. Right, right. Yeah. So does that is is that um, part of your new book as well, the the propagandist's playbook? That's just yeah, like it's a little bit about that. So in my research, I think about how um, so my book that just came out called the Propagandist's Playbook. I think about the ways in which search engines are manipulated for political gain, and so specifically, I'm interested in how um, search engine optimization is is used uh, not only to advertise things like commercial products but also to target audiences in terms of political um, participation and, and uh, voter turnout, right? And so what I, I look at in my research is when um, the news is heavily concentrated on topics that may not benefit um, a political party or a representative, they are uh, very good at creating a set of concerns um, centered around very specific keywords and phrases so that when you search for information on these topics, um, it shifts your attention towards those topics. So yeah, I think a lot about how search engines are not just um, a way in which we seek new information, but also can reconfirm those, those situations. Right, so does, it, does this have anything to do then with what, what I've known from sort of the marketing terminology as spin? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, we see this a lot happening. For example, what's a great one? If I'm trying to manufacture a competitor for Cheetos, um, I'm not going to want to like use Cheetos in my name because uh, Cheetos, when you Google it, is like dominated by Frito-Lay or whoever produces the Cheeto brand. Sorry, I'm not as, I, I don't really know all those backgrounds. So, um, business scholar, you know, business people use this all the time. Like if you're trying to start a business that's going to compete with this, you have to take advantage of um, new keywords and phrases so that you can optimize your content in a way that's not necessarily trying to like compete directly with this like stronghold on traffic that existing brands already have. Um, what, what Microsoft researchers refer to this concept as like data voids. So when little to nothing exists online, there's like a void in a search bubble, if you think about it, right? Um, and this can be because there's like a very specific phrase that doesn't exist yet, or perhaps there's like a breaking news cycle. Um, an example they talk about in their research uh, looks at like the Sutherland Park shootings. So when that was happening, all of a sudden, a bunch of people are searching Sutherland. And up until that point, there existed like a Zillow link, right? <laughs> it was just a void. There was very little information about that that key word. Um, and so it was like the news was catching up to that cycle, that void was being filled. And so business people are looking at this all the time, right? Like, where is there a void that I can try to capture in terms of selling a product? What I try to do is think about it in terms of um, political uh, involvement, as well as like news and information. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. No, thank I you. I threw in a random Cheetos example. So I don't yeah. know. I, I think I'm just hungry. Time. <laughs> That's right. Um, so the, I want to follow up one last thing, and then I want to make sure I get to some of these other questions. But the, the sense of distraction that you said, right, that, that a political party can fill this data void with um, a, a way to not only um, give you different information or even misinformation, but to, to, to take you away from the issue entirely. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to me as a parent, 
I know the power of distraction, right? Mm -hmm. When your child is, is just totally focused on something and you say, oh, well, what about this? And boom, off they go. Is that, is that a similar kind of experience that we are finding online? Sure. And what I think is really important to recognize is that um, what I refer to as this keyword curation and strategic signaling is more than just an online information system. So it requires um, kind of stitching together radio, television, newspapers, digital first content, and you um, repeat these phrases throughout these broadcasts or podcasts or uh you know, um, I guess broadcast refers to both television or radio. Mm -hmm. And and then you're signaling people to to search for more information on the subject. And, and what I find through a detailed content analysis of like news and radio and podcasts is that they're activating this idea of go search for it yourself. So it's not just like, yeah, believe me, um, this keyword is a big deal. And it makes more sense to think about it instead of this. They're like, you know, we're talking so much about the impeachment, but we should really be talking about X, Y, Z. Why is no one talking about X, Y, Z? If I were you, I would Google X, Y, Z, right? And I, I refer to this as like the IKEA effect of misinformation. So again, like the business scholars, people have found that when they are activated to put furniture together, they value low quality furniture more than if it's just sold to them. And so um, creating this like kind of tangible do it yourself quality when it comes to information seeking um, is also part of this process. Right, right. Now that's fascinating. It's sort of, again, my uh, approach in marketing or storytelling has always been this sort of subliminal messaging or um, yeah. you know, ways of, of directing attention and, and therefore influence. Uh, on people. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, the uh, I, I do have a, a question here from um, someone who had posted. Um, it, the, the question reads, are you interested in researching international communities or oh, only yeah. focusing on um, American United States communities? Yeah, definitely. So part of my new research study, I'm um, basically conducting a lot of preliminary research so that I I can apply for grants that would most definitely take me out of a U.S. context. I mean, ultimately, I'm interested in the way that um, semantics influence returns. And so I, I want to look at that in terms of other languages and also, you know, within other languages, the various cultural contexts that embody other languages as well. Um, but, but most definitely, this is like on my radar in terms of something that I want to look at. That's a yeah. great question. Yeah, no, I think that that sense of context is so important. So uh, important. For everything we do. And um, it's hard, I think, sometimes to figure out what, I mean, because context is so multi-layered, mm -hmm. right? Um, how, do we, how do we decide whether this particular element of context is important or that particular element of context? Um, but that's, I'm, I'm sure the, as a sociologist, you're, you're wrestling with that all the time because it's we all love that. context. Right. It's all social context. Yeah. Sociologists yeah. are kind of that are like power, right? right. <laughs> Which is culturally right. concerned. Like, uh, anyway. Right. right. <laughs> well, and then, and then, as you say, that the issues of language itself, um, and how, how people use language, how it's constructed, um, even just the, uh, the sort of syntax of language, I'm sure is gonna change how people search, how they think about things, all of that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's like Michael Foucault's uh, in search engine optimization combined, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the philosophy of search engines. The philosophy of search, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> right. Um, another question, uh, this is uh, actually a very easy one because it's a yes, no question. Um, are you willing to take PhD students next year? Oh man, I, I, I saw that one ahead of time. I mean, I would love to teach PhD students. Um, I don't, I, I don't know how funding is structured, um, within the school. I feel like that's a broader question outside of my, my, my pay grade. I would love to, to take PhD students. Um, people who are interested in working with me should most definitely, uh, reach out and, um, touch base. Great, thank you. Um, uh, switch to something maybe a little more personal um, and uh, still professional possibly, but I'm, I'm intrigued what you've read 
recently, oh. uh, either just for your own personal enjoyment or uh, for professional development, whatever. Uh, sure. You like yeah. Um, I mean, I read a lot of books. I love books. I love I love fiction and also reading for work. Um, let's see. What did I read lately? Fiction-wise, I would say um, I really like this book. Nobody is talking about this. Um, it's written in this like Twitter kind of. It's it's about this like Twitter influencer. I think it's Patricia Lockwood. I believe is the name. Okay. Um, but yeah, nobody is talking about this. I thought it was really fascinating. Uh, read that was my recent nonfiction. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. That was my recent fiction. fiction. That was my recent fiction. Yeah. Okay. And are you a nonfiction reader for for pleasure, or is most? Um, I would say I'm like. Uh, I mean, I thankfully I take pleasure in what I research. Right. I I feel like we're very we're very lucky to do what we love to do for work. Um. So I read a lot of stuff that I uh for work. Um, I would say Messengers of the Right was one of the better books I read recently, as well as um, Jesus and John Wayne, I thought was also really, really good. These are both uh, nonfiction books um, mm -hmm. that I thought were highly influential in, in my own readings as I started work. Okay. Well, great. Well, I think, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, this, is, this has been wonderful. It's, it's always great to talk to you. Um, it's nice to see you in the hallways of Manning Hall as well as on Zoom. Um, and uh, I think we're, we're about out of time. So I'm going to uh, say thank you again, Francesca, and we'll transition to our next. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was fun. Brad Hemminger, welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm watching uh, Susan and Samantha doing all this work behind the scenes to make it it's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, we have a thumbs up for segment two. Uh, hi, I'm Brad Hemminger. Um, I'm ready to answer questions. Okay, well, we have uh, quite a few. Um, and I'll start with the same question that I started with uh, for Francesca, which is... Um, what are you currently working on academically or what new projects do you foresee coming in the, uh, in the somewhat immediate future? Um, we're just wrapping up uh, two projects recently that might be of interest. Um, one of them is uh, the title, of the main paper is going to be Breaking Up Isn't Hard to Do. Um, probably it's an older song for most of our students that are listening to that, but um, this is about um, academic libraries and big deals. And so big deals is how you subscribe to many journals from one publisher. It's kind of like uh, cable TV packages um, where you get a lot of stuff that you may not want and you pay more than you want. And so uh, the kind of you know cable cutting is the same thing that's happening with uh, library licensing. Um, and this is an interesting topic. It's connected to the high, what's called the serials crisis, which is the high price of journals and libraries can't afford them. And so how are libraries dealing with that? And one of the things that's happening is they're having to break the big deals to cancel that subscription because they, for several reasons. And uh, so we did a nice study that looked at all the major libraries that have broken big deals. This is a couple of years ago, and we're still finishing the analysis of that. Um, and there are a few interesting takeaways. One was that the biggest reason that they do it is financial um, because they're under financial pressure and so they kind of have to do it. Um, the second biggest reason is they want to do it. It's the institutional value library. They want to make access open to journals and uh, make them uh, uh, available. And the third thing that was kind of scaring people off is they didn't want to be the first one to do this because they were, they were afraid if they did it, it would be it wouldn't work out well or their administration would slam them or their faculty would be upset. Um, and so a number of institutions have done this. And so that last barrier is kind of going away and more and more institutions are facing the financial pressure. And so it's really topical here at UNC because we had broken a couple of big deals, but then this last year because of 
fiscal issues tied to COVID and state budgets and things like that, we had to cut practically all of our big deals. So we're actually now went from behind the curve to jumping off the cliff in front of the curve. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, so that was, I think, a really relevant study for a lot of libraries. Yeah. The, that's in my area of scholar communications, which is my main research area, but um, kind of related to that, we were looking at how courses have been taught. And this was a, a sort of a sideline because of COVID and teaching with Zoom. And I was curious about the effect of classroom instruction in Zoom versus face-to-face. -face. And so this opportunity presented itself where we converted all of our classes at UNC for a year or so to Zoom. And so we ran a study looking at um, the students' experiences and instructors' experiences between those two. And the probably the expected outcome that we might have expected was that face-to-face -face is generally better in most kinds of engagement. We're using engagement kind of as a surrogate for how well the class worked. Mm -hmm. um, but the surprising thing was that Zoom was actually not that much worse in many ways. They were not that you know, distinguished. Um, and there were some positives like the convenience of attending class and, you know, especially during the stresses of COVID where you might be taking care of kids or someone in your household or just things going on. Um, and some of the activities that we thought would be hard, like group work, actually were done pretty well through like the breakout groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really interesting. There's a lot more detail to that one. That one's also getting written out. So I'd say those are kind of the two, two most recent ones. Okay. Can I go jump back to the first one for just a moment? Yeah. Um, you said that they, they were concerned about leading because of the possibility of, of upsetting their faculty. Mm -hmm. Do you have any data to show whether the faculty were supportive or whether the, uh, the upsetness of not being able to have a particular journal has been predominant? Um, it's a great question. And one of the things that when we compiled this, we were trying to, we were producing this sort of guidelines for how to best handle this. And so we looked at the ways that libraries respond to this. And so libraries that were upfront and explained what was happening and sought kind of approval or explained it well, often had less pushback from faculty. Mm -hmm. um, those that didn't or didn't engage with the faculty or didn't communicate beforehand, just kind of did it out of necessity, but did it without communicating, often got more pushback. I think the faculty wants to understand what's happening are generally supportive, but in many cases they don't, they're not aware of what's going on behind the scenes. And so it was, it's like, are you taking away my journal? Why? Um, yeah, no, the importance of um, speaking of scholarly communication. Yeah, um, just communication, yeah, period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, communication between the administration and the, and the budget people and the faculty and mm -hmm. making that whole community much more transparent, I think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, a little shift here, Brad. Um, the, I, I know with uh, here at SILS, you are sort of intimately involved with the virtual reality mm -hmm. lab. Um, and I know you've had an interest in both virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your perception of the value of that modality for LIS um, students and or the sort of education or the field itself? Yeah, it's uh, maybe kind of a tech thing we might not have thought would be part of like LIS. Um, I got drawn to it. I'm a computer science kind of by background. Um, and I kind of liked the coolness of it. And computer graphics was something I did uh, in my, my graduate work. Um, but I think this ability to put you in like an entirely different world um, is what excited me about it. Um, and then as I kind of worked more with it, it's just the creative freedom of being able to create spaces and, and allowing that to be done by anybody, right? So I could build a skyscraper, I could build a city, I could do artwork. I didn't have to actually have materials to do that. I could just imagine it and then execute that in a, in a virtual reality. Um, and it also gives you different kinds of spaces to participate or engage with other people. Um, you can have any kind of avatar that you want. Um, and so there's, there's a whole range of things that happen from like practical stuff, like you can do um, therapeutic over phobias or PTSD uh, to this versus the creation of stuff. Um, and as the technology has improved, especially like the glasses and headsets, if, you know, we imagine it being more like just like kind of a 
uh, sunglasses at some point, not these big bulky things. Um, I'm more excited about the mixed realities or augmented realities. And that's where you have not just this virtual space that's imagined, but it's overlaid on top of your world. Um, so for instance, think about if you're on campus and then there's this massive sculpture um, you know, just below South Building, and everybody walked by and goes, oh, wow, that's cool. Um, we can really change how we view the world and how we experience the world by having these uh, virtual things added to uh, real life. Um, it presents a lot of challenges, right? Um, so, like, if I can put that sculpture there, well, what if it's offensive to some people, right? Um, who's going to see it? How do you have control over those kinds of things? Um and these are ways that we engage and inform and interact with people. And this is what a library science school is, is what library information science is all about, right? How do we provide, make accessible information and knowledge and things like that? And so I think a lot of this is going to occur in these more virtual and combined spaces. So I think it's important for us to be in this field. Um, and uh, I think we can provide a lot of uh, good policy making and thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. The, um, we've had a couple of questions uh, posed about research assistance, um, mm -hmm. whether or not you are taking any, um, whether you or not you have projects that have existing uh, research assistance on them. Um, in particular, I know on your, on your website, you talk about the information visualization of annotations on a large scale project and that mm -hmm. you, have, <clears throat> you have a research assistant there. Um, so I guess there are two questions here. One is, um, are, you, are you going to be taking any more uh, research assistance? Or is there an opportunity for current students or future students to get involved in your research and work with you? Uh, so let me ask that one first, and then I'll come back and ask this. Yeah. Um, there's always opportunities for students. So I encourage you, uh, kind of like what Francesca was saying, is to, to talk with us, talk with the faculty. Um, sometimes, like I have uh, several doctoral students, I may not have cycles for more at a certain time, or I may not have grant funding for people. Um, that kind of varies, you know, from semester to semester, what your grant funding is. Uh, but I'm always interested in, in working with students. Um, and so either on, you might do an independent study or just work as a volunteer with us if it's not a paid position. In all those cases, just come, just come talk to me or other faculty. I think the faculty are happy to, to talk to you. I encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, the, the annotation study that you mentioned, I think, is kind of a nice example. That one spanned uh, just as background. So the, this is a, in scholarship, there's a lot of artifacts. And we think of like journals and books and stuff like that. And I promote the whole sort of scholarship cycle as being important and to capture all the pieces of that. And so one of the things that you might capture is annotations. And so our sort of global annotation system was designed to capture everybody in the world's thoughts and knowledge. So if you have a journal article, anybody in the world could annotate it, right? And so we benefit from everyone's knowledge. So that's kind of a huge undertaking, right? And there's a lot of issues about, well, how do you moderate that or curate that? And we were looking at it from that perspective, but also a visualization perspective. Like if I have 10,000 annotations on a scholarly article, how do I even look at those? How do I make sense of those? And so we were building visualization systems that would you know, present that to you in a manageable fashion. Um, that was a project that went over five or six years and three or four students right, all, all participated in it. And in my lab, I'm kind of like all about the students being in charge. I want them to become independent, capable researchers. And so I kind of set, here's our goals. Here's what the grant funding is. And then I try to give you as much power as you can. I want you to like first author papers and stuff like that. So um, that's at least how, how I work. Yeah, no, that's great. So from the, from the flip side, then, um, a student who might be considering a, a research position, what kinds of questions should they be asking themselves to determine if a particular position is is right for them, as a, or whether a research position at all is yeah. right for them, I think it's it's all about fit. I mean, like when you're interviewing for a job, it's the same thing, right? You you want to really communicate. You want to understand what you want, and you want to try to communicate that. And you want to ask the the hiring person, the faculty member, say in this case, what they're looking for, right? 
Um, so sometimes it's particular skills, like we need particular skills for a certain uh, grant project. Um, but it's also like, what, what's, your, what's your desire? Where are you trying to get to? You're going to become an academic. You're going to be a researcher in the industry. And figuring out that fit. Um, and so to, to me, it's just kind of having an honest conversation about what your goals are, what you want, what your skills might be, and, and figuring out if there's a match. Okay. And um, I, I assume that it's okay if uh, interested students or students who would be interested in working with you could yeah. reach out to you and yeah. drop you an email and say, you know, introduce themselves. Exactly. We get a lot of students do that. So I encourage everyone to do that. Okay, great. Um, so I have a very particular question here, which I find fascinating. So I'm just going to read it. Um, and so the student says, as a student interested in expanding accessibility of content, to an online and public forum through code, do you suggest a specific degree focus in SILs? And then more specifically, would either digital libraries, UX, human computer interaction, or data science specializations be more beneficial for this professional interest? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, user experience, um, HCI is the closest fit to that. Uh, we have specializations within the both the MSIS and LS, um, and those are definitely about accessibility. Um, digital libraries, institutional repositories, those kind of things also be somewhat of a fit because they're holding those things, but it's more about the presentation. That's why I would say kind of the UX uh, side of that. Um, data science is more about kind of the analytics and stuff, and so I'd say that's a little less close. Mm -hmm. And do you see a... a fairly good distinction or a strong distinction between data science and information science? Um, data science, I think, is kind of a buzzword. Uh, it's a, it's a, about a lot of stuff that we've been doing in information library science for a long time. Um, I, I, we've been trying to, we're actually in the process of putting up better uh, language about that on our websites. Uh, but it's more on, on this large sets of information that we can process, right, and the analytic tools that we do. But at SILs in particular, it's about the human side of that. How does it affect society? What are the policies that go with that, right? It's not just what's the algorithm I use to compute that. It's the ramifications that occur and how we should plan for those kinds of things. So again, back to what uh, Francesca was talking about with the importance of context. Yeah. Uh, that this is, it's, we look at the entire data life cycle in that sense and mm -hmm. uh, the sociological context, the political context in which all of this stuff is being both created and stored and analyzed and, and, yeah. um, and understood. Um, and uh, sort exactly. of like, yeah, the, the, yeah, the data science may, may do pieces of that, but maybe not with the same sort of sociological lens that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Well, again, I think we're almost out of time. Brad, so thank you very much for joining us here. Hey, I thought you were going to ask me about a book recommendation. What's this? Cast. Oh, absolutely. What, so what's if that? you haven't read this, this is what I just finished. Cast. It's, it's, about, it's about caste systems, so racial discrimination on this, but connected to like India's caste system, Nazi Germany. So it's you can do all the diversity training you want, but I would read that book first. That's a really good book. Okay. Cast. Great. Well, thank you for the recommendation. And uh, we'll transition ourselves here over to our third faculty member. Hold on just a moment. Thank you. Okay, Jaime Arjuelo, thank you for joining us. Uh, happy to be here, happy to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Absolutely. No, it's great to have you here. Um, so I, I have several questions uh, for you as well uh, as part of our interview, some of which have been submitted by uh, our listeners either in advance or, or during the thing. Um, as, as a quick reminder, um, if you are listening and you would like to ask a question of, of Jaime, then please uh, put it in the description box on YouTube and we'll try and get that worked in. 
So I'll start with the same question that I started with the others. Um, what are you currently working on, Jaime, uh, academically, or what projects do you see coming down the line? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on a bunch of different things. So I think I'm just going to pick one. Um, so one of the areas where I'm uh, doing research is called Searches Learning. And, and this is research that I'm doing with PhD student uh, Kelsey Ergo. Uh, and so Search as Learning basically uh, studies how learning happens during search um, and also uh, on developing tools uh, that encourage and support learning during search. And so Kelsey's dissertation is looking at the role of goal setting during search. So when people set goals and work towards specific goals as they search, does that mean that they have better experiences or does that encourage and support uh, more learning? Uh, and so we we just finished this study where um, Kelsey designed this simple little tool called the Subgoal Manager. And so it's a tool for note taking, but it basically encourages you to set specific goals, uh, take notes with respect to those goals, and then uh, mark goals as complete when you feel like you, you've completed the goals. Uh, and so we ran a study that had three conditions. In one condition, we didn't give a participants the sub goal manager. We basically just said, here, learn about this topic and take notes on a Google Doc. Uh, in the other condition, we gave them the sub goal manager uh, with pre populated goals. So we assigned the goals to the participant. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the third condition, we had participants set their own goals. Um, and in that condition, we also coached the participants in how to set good goals. And so it turns out that there's research on goal setting uh, that basically has found that good sub goals uh, involve a specific action, uh, involve a specific type of content, uh, involve a time frame that is uh, that basically is for allocate you know a time frame that you've allocated to the goal, uh, and also have criteria that are you're, that you're going to use to measure success. Um, and so when, when goals have all these characteristics, they're actually much better for you. And what we found is that uh, participants had better experiences and they learned more when they had access to the sub goal manager and they were able to set their own goals, which, which I think is interesting. Um, and then we looked uh, more deeply at that data and we, we actually analyzed the types of goals that people set uh, in that condition. And we put people in two different bins. We, we put uh, in one bin, uh, people set high quality sub goals. So the, goal, the goals had all these uh, high uh, characteristics that make uh, goals high quality. And then up in the other bin, uh, they set goals, but they were not as not as high quality. And we found that people who set uh, high quality sub goals uh, had even better uh, learning outcomes. Um, so that's, yeah, that's an area that I'm involved in. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for the follow up study that Kelsey is, is designing for her uh, dissertation, which is now going to try to answer the question, like, why did that happen? Right? What, what, what is really the role of sub goals? How do they help? Uh, do they help you uh, monitor your progress? Do they help you determine when when something's not working for you and you, you need to adjust uh, your strategies? Uh, so basically answering the, the how and the why questions. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounds fascinating. The, um, the it, it, reminds me of sort of the strategic planning literature and, and strategizing. And, you know, if you, if you set up a plan, then it helps you think sort of metacognitively about mm -hmm. what you're doing and what's going on, as opposed to just being immersed in the moment. That's, and, yeah, that's correct. And in, and in this, in this study, we found that uh, when people who basically set their own goals, they felt that they were better at um, monitoring their progress and adjusting their uh their behavior when things were not working. Um, but we only measured perceptions of those things. We haven't really looked at how exactly that happens during the search process. Right. Yeah. Now I can also see the, that sort of intrinsic motivation um, of setting your own goals. I know yeah. in my work with um, the children and reading, um, oftentimes if you, if the, the research shows that if you let children choose their own reading, they are much more motivated to read. Uh, it sounds as though you're finding similar kinds of things here that if, if, if you choose your own goals, you're much more motivated to complete them. Yeah. yeah. Like externally imposed. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, can we shift a little bit here, Jaime? And um, I know you're very interested in aggregated search. And I think, um, I, I think we'd, we'd love to know 
first of all, what that is. Um, so people who don't know can understand aggregated mm -hmm. search because it's a, a fairly um, consistent part of your, your past research anyway, mm -hmm. and why that really intrigues you. Sure, sure. So aggregated search was basically the topic of my dissertation, and I continued working on it uh, when I came to SILS. Uh, the, in principle, it's a very simple idea. It's basically developing systems, developing search systems that search other search systems. Um, and uh, we're all actually familiar with aggregated search because Google is an example of aggregated search. Uh, Google is not just one search engine, it's many different search engines, right? So there's a search engine for uh, web documents, but there's also one for news, one for video, one for images, one for local businesses, there's either one for advertisements, right? And so you have these these different back uh, back end systems, which we call verticals. Um, and so aggregated search is, is this idea of yeah, developing systems that sort of combine results from different back end systems. Um, it involves lots of different predictive tasks. Uh, so for instance, the system has to decide which backend systems to send the query to because it's uh, inefficient to send it to all the different backend systems. So there's sort of a uh, behind the scenes, there's the decision of do I even search, let's say the news search engine? Like, is this query newsworthy? Mm -hmm. Then there's the decision of sort of where do you present results from a specific resource? Uh, do you know, do you present it at the, at the very top? Do you put it in the middle? Do you put it on the side? Do you put it at the bottom? And then the decision of how to present them. Um, and so there's lots of different uh, things that the system has to uh, decide. Um, and I think it's fascinated, fascinating because in terms of evaluation, um, it's just really hard to evaluate aggregated search systems. Um, you know, the if you're thinking about what the goal of a search engine is, uh, one simple way to think about it is, you know, the goal of the search engine is to put, is to put the most relevant things in places where you're most likely to see them and most likely to engage with them. Uh, but it turns out that sort of, you know, visual attention to something uh, is influenced by lots of different factors, right? It's, it's influenced by where uh, the results are positioned, but it's influenced by how they're positioned. They're also influenced by sort of the individual and their mental model of how, how the system works. So I think that there's a lot of really interesting questions. So for example, like one of the things that uh, I looked at, uh, uh, well, when I came to SILS, I, I sort of started this line of research that looked at basically how result, how certain results influence your perception or your willingness to engage with other results. And so what we found is that, for instance, if you show images, uh, you know, results that come from the image vertical, and those images are not relevant, um, then that influences your perception or your willingness to engage with other results that are coming from a completely different system, right? So that's an example where sort of people are behaving in a way that's not consistent with how the system works. And so it's almost like people have the wrong mental model. Ideally, you should look at the image results and if they're not relevant, you should not necessarily assume that other results on the page are also not relevant. Um, I don't know if, if does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I um, certainly not my research area, but um, fascinating. And yeah. uh, I mean, it's some of the things that the terms that come to my mind are probably outdated now. But things like banner blindness and um, you know the the real estate of the center of the of the screen as being the most valuable. I don't know whether that's still the case, but that's what. A, I remember reading at one point that if you wanted to attract someone's attention, the center of the screen was sort of the, the place yeah. to put it. Whereas in photography, if you center something in the middle of the screen, it actually detracts because it's it's not off center. It's it doesn't it doesn't get. So is there this sense in um, in web design as well that um, that that placement is there a is there a best placement to grab to grab attention that we know of now? No, I think that's a that's an interesting point. I mean, it's a it's really an open question, and it's just constantly evolving, right? So, you know, search engine evaluation used to be really simple because the because the paradigm was basically just rank the results in a you know in a list, right? Um, and so we developed all these different evaluation metrics that kind of assume that the results are presented, you know, in a one dimensional list. And now we've sort of moved away from that, where things are presented, you know, all over the place, right? In sort of a two dimensional um, 
display, right? You can have things on the side. And also, you know, uh, results sometimes contain thumbnail images, sometimes they don't. Um, so you have to make all these different decisions. Um, and so really, it's a, I guess the answer to, to, to your question is that I think it's still an open question that people are investigating. And, and any any time we sort of change the way that we displace things, we then have to rethink, okay, how are we going to estimate the probability that you're going to see results in a specific, you know, see certain results on the page? Mm -hmm. So what, I guess that as, a, as a follow up to that, one of the things that makes me think is that, um, you know, there is a there's a deep power to ritual um, and to routine um, so that so that if we are confronted with an interface that we know and expect, then there are ways we can interact with it with, because we don't have to learn new. We don't have to search. Um, whereas if, if you present someone with a, a totally new interface and the menu is on the right instead of the left and we're used to it there, it's across the bottom instead of the top, then there's this whole learning curve of the interface that is, is required of the user that's going to take time and effort and energy and may take concentration or focus away from the content itself because you're trying to learn the system. Right, right. Um, and, and so I guess there I'm wondering, is, is, there, any, um, is there any work on um, this sense of standardization that's going to lead us to saying, you know, the best place to put the menu is across the top. Just it, it's where we're used to it. Leave it there. Leave it alone. Stop moving it around. Um, if you want to log out, there's a certain <laughs> icon we all recognize, and it's going to be in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. I mean, is that the kind of thing that's going to eventually come out of this? Or is there a real power to kind of like the, the Costco model of mm -hmm. reshelving everything in the place so that you have to browse, you have to explore and spend time um, on the page? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think that there is... Um... I don't know if this is related, but uh, you know there is there there has been a lot of work on sort of Gestalt principles, um, and and you know so basically these are just sort of uh, principles of how uh, assumptions people make about information based on how it's displayed, um, and 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 I think that's something that yeah generally speaking IR researchers try to conform you know uh, with so for instance you know people are going to make assumptions like. Things that are close together are related, or things that are displayed in the same manner are related, or things that are enclosed within a border are related. And so these are things that you, you know, IR researchers can sort of uh, fall back on to sort of, you know, to, to, to influence how people, uh, to influence how, how people sort of perceive results that are, that are displayed. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Um, no, I think it's a fascinating area of research. Um, so if, if somebody would, if a student would like to essentially be you um, and study search systems, um, what's the best way to go about getting the, the knowledge base that they need to develop that expertise? Uh, I mean, I would, stay, I would start by taking an, an, an a information retrieval, um, which is a class that I teach at SILS. Um, I would suggest taking machine learning um, because for, you know, for better or worse, it's, it's, it's a tool that we use for lots of predictive tasks in information retrieval. Um, maybe taking a statistics course and maybe taking a course sort of, if you're interested more in the human side of things, maybe taking a um, HCI course, um, which I would encourage uh, students to consider because there's a lot of low hanging fruit that involves studying people in the context of IR. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot, there's, you know, uh, studying people is difficult, and so a lot of people shy away from it. But there's a lot of opportunity if you're willing to, uh, yeah, study people and, and study communities um, of people. And is there is there a good sequence to do that? I mean, should you take IR first and then HCI, or does it make sense to do HCI and then IR, or, or is it really um, they're they're sort of parallel? I think they're more they're more parallel. I think they're more okay. parallel in terms of the system side of things. I think. You know, taking taking IR is probably a good place to start, um, or or machine learning. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're uh, we're out of time for uh, our interview. Thank you so much, Jaime, for joining us.
Yeah, my uh, pleasure. My it's pleasure. Been a, it's been a delight chatting with you and, and learning more about your area of research and the kinds of projects you have. And um, I'll ask you as a final question: um, Is it also okay for prospective students or um, interested students who would like to know more about your area to drop you an email and get in touch and introduce themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I'm always uh, I'm always willing uh, and eager to to talk to anybody who wants to get involved in uh, in research. Um, you know, like like Brad said, uh, sometimes I have I have funding and sometimes I don't, and so I can't make any promises. But I'm always willing to to chat. Uh, and of course, I mean, if a student is willing to do research, if I happen to not have funding and a, and a student just wants to get involved in research, maybe as an independent study, um, then that's always a possibility. Right. Yeah. No, I think there. I think that's true for all of our faculty that we're we're always happy to get students involved in research um, on whatever topics we're working with, or or even for, for students who have their own topic um, that they really want to explore. There are avenues to to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So well, thank you, Jaime, and um, uh, that's going to conclude our AMA or Ask Me Anything session for today. Um, I want to say a, a quick thank you to our production team, Susan Sylvester and Samantha Delaria, for um, their excellent work behind the scenes here. And we hope you will join us next time for our next edition with um, some more of our faculty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>